We're in the book of 1 Thessalonians. What a wonderful book. This is a really a good book for young believers as well. And we did a salutation introduction in the first four verses. And then last time we studied verse 5. What a wonderful concept he gave us in verse 5. And I'm going to go back and read it because, listen to me up here. Paul is a master of the Greek language. I keep telling you that. But you're just going to have to believe him when I tell you he's a really master. And when you study the Greek language with his writings, even in a simple book of doctrine like 1 Thessalonians, a great book to get to whet your appetite for the study of the Word of God. He uses, for example, in verse 5, 6, and 7, he uses the word genomai. G-I-N, it's on your paper. G-I-N-O-M-A-I. And sometimes you have to pay attention to how it's translated because sometimes, like in verse 5, it's translated come. And in the next two verses, 6 and 7, it's translated become. But actually, genomai means become. It's, it should be, that should be your first, when you see genomai, the first thing you should say no matter how it's translated, because the English translates words, you know, to be comfortable within your own language. But it should always be, it always should be become. And what become means, it means a change of condition. A change of condition. Every time you see the word ginomai, and you will if you go to this church, because I'll, I point it out to you. But you can't see it in the English. Like in verse 5, you can't see it. Here, here it is. In verse 5, and, and I'm just going to read it and now point it out. For our, our gospel did not come. See the word come? That's get oh my. To you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And I studied, we studied that. Now listen, that's what the gospel brings. That's what the gospel brings. The gospel is that, you know, Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Can I help you, my friend? Oh, it's, it's all the way in the back. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. You betcha, buddy. I appreciate that. Man, I'm hungry for the study of the word. Uh, we're, we're at verse 5. We're in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Our gospel did not come. The word come is genomai. It means do become. It, it, it did not come in word only, but it came in word, what he means by that, by word, power, Holy Spirit, and full conviction. And, and what, what is that? The gospel. Then in verse 6, look at verse 6. He says, you also became imitators of us. See the word became? That's genomai became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. See, now he's talking to the, those who have gotten saved in verse 5. He's talking to them in verse 6 and in verse 7. Watch verse 7. So that, which leads off from verse 6, talking to Christians, imitators of the Lord, us and the Lord, having received the Lord in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that, imitators of, of the Lord, so that you became an example or a model or a type. The word, the word is tupos, T-U-P-O-S, and it means a model. A model, an example, or actually what the English called example Actually, a proper translation from the Greek to the English would be example, E-N-S-A-M-P-L-E. But, but it means a, 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 a model or a type to all the believers. Listen, these are believers in all of Macedonia and Archaea. That's Greece, what we call Greece today. These people have gotten saved. They've become imitators of the Lord and Paul, Pauline team that evangelized them and have become a model 
for the entire country of Greece. Whoa, and that good. So we're going to talk about that because there is us. I know it's not good English, but it's not good Greek either. So there we are. Get saved, be an imitator, and be a model. You ever want to be a model? Well, you can be one, and we'll tell you how to do it today. Our title of our sermon is Be Imitators of the Lord. Once you're saved, become imitators so that you can become models to other Christians. Huh? Those that have the same culture, the, under the same flag, so to speak, and all that. In other words, start at home. You know, that's Acts 1 8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and most parts of the earth. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember those requests that we've mentioned earlier. We'll have them specially mentioned, and we'll get into morning study. Become imitators of the Lord. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it, learn it, nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types or, or sins of the tongue, overt. Mental attitude, you know. What do I do to get out of carnality and back to spirituality? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The cleansing takes us back to the cross of Christ as a believer, not for salvation, but for sanctification through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How do I get back into sanctification, experiential sanctification, where the Holy Spirit is dominating my life, my prayer life, my living life, my testimonial life, my reading of the scriptures, how it applies to my life, all of that? I confess my sin. I name it, I homo legeo. I name it to the Father. And the blood of Christ cleanses me from my personal sin, not for salvation this time, but for sanctification. My, my, my. Isn't God wonderful? What a wonderful plan God has. Grace plan. Say, all that's grace, dear hearts. All that's grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't have to beg for it. But you have to be obedient to it. So let's pray. I give you a moment of silence to prepare your heart. Those of you that are here by automobile and those who are visiting with us by the Internet. This is so that the Holy Spirit can teach and recall the Word of God from your soul through this study to your, to your human experience as the weeks to come. Our Father, we're so thankful today to have the privilege to stand before the throne of grace and make prayer requests according to your will. You are, they are heard and done. You have the power, Father, of the prayer. We have the prayer and you have the power. And we certainly understand it. We lift Glenda Wolliver before you, Father, and ask you to heal her body. She has, still has Nisha Mahaim, the breath of God in her. And I have no other request but to heal her and set her feet back on solid ground that she could be the model witness to others of the dynamics of what it means to be saved by grace through faith and not of herself. It is a gift of God. And for the Ray family, losing both grandparents within about a week is a whole lot. But we know, Father, you've got the whole lot. I pray that they would find the comfort of the Holy Spirit in this time of, of bereavement. I pray, Father, today for our service. I pray that the Holy Spirit would minister each of our lives. How do we become imitators of Christ so that we become models to those around us? Teach it to us today, Father, in this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can teach it in this hour, but listen, it may take longer with the Holy Spirit teaching it to you. 
You know what's interesting about our Bible study, even our school of biblical theology? We don't give you material to read ahead of time. We give you material to read after you leave class. Because we need to explain what it says so that the Holy Spirit can explain how it relates to your life. Oh boy, read John 14, 15, and 16 in regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said when he comes, here's what he's going to do. One of them is to teach and recall the word of God from your soul. But you got to have it there. So we don't do it like secular education where we give it to you up front. Of course, you have the book. <laughs> we give it to you in class so you can study afterwards so the Holy Spirit can take what has been taught and show you how to apply it to your life and how, how meaningful it is to you personally. See, I think that's the dynamics of the Word of God. It was for me. It was when I would hear it and then come back to understand it and pray, God, just show me how this applies to my life. I mean, I don't know. He would do it. He would do it. And when he does that, then you become an imitator. And when you become an imitator, when that becomes a lifestyle in your life, you become a model to other people. I know you don't want to set out in your mind, well, I'm going to be a model, but you become one. So we're going to talk about that today. Remember, the key word in 5, 6, and 7 is ginomai in the Greek language. It is the word become. I, once again, I talk about it in my introduction to you. I say it in 1 Thessalonians, we have become. And then in verse 6, we have become. In verse 7, we have become. Notice I left blank lines. In 1, 6, you have become what? What should you put there? In verse 6, imitator. In verse 7, you have become model, an example, a model. Yeah? We have become. Uh, there's a, he's talking about having a changed condition. In verse 5, he used the aorist tense for salvation. In verse 6 and 7, he's using the aorist tense for, for periods of spiritual growth. An aorist tense when you become aware as a Christian that you're to be an imitator of the Lord. And then once that settles in, so that you can become a model to other people, other believers. So that's really important that, that, that I just, you know, I've emphasized it and I hope you caught it. The importance of the word genomai. It means a changed condition within your soul that affects your life. You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he behaves. And that's what we're after today. So I want to talk about, today I want to talk about four uh, conditions or characteristics of an imitator of the Lord that Paul declares in point number one in verse six of 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul declared that the newly formed body of recently saved people of Thessalonica became imitators. They had, bec they had become imitators. You also became imitators. You also became imitators. You got saved, Genomai. And you developed your Christian life to be imitators of the Lord. Imitators. Uh, notice the Greek word, the Greek word, M-I-M-E-T-E-S. That's the word mime. You know, a mime, M-I-M-E. Did I say that right? Doesn't sound right in my ear. Uh, or to mimic in the English. To imitate, to imitate. What is interesting for those that, here, here's what's interesting about the word imitate. It's a predicate nominative. Let me go back and look at it in the, Greek, in, in the English. You 
also became imitators. A predicate nominative, this is English as well, connects the subject with the verb for emphasizing the predicate, the predicate verbal nominative idea. It's called a predicate nominative. It's connected both to the noun, uh, to the subject, and the verb uh, for emphasis. The spotlight goes on it. Boom. You who are out of verse 5, who have been saved by believing that Jesus, the gospel, is a person. Let me say that again. The gospel is about a person and his work. Jesus' gospel, Jesus died for your sins, Adamic sin, Romans 5, 12 through 21, as well as all the other sins. But the sin that, that, he's, that you've got to acknowledge, you, that you're a sinner, that's Adamic sin, 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. You're a sinner. Jesus came to rescue you from the slave market of Adam's sin. That's at Colossians 1.13. He came to rescue you and to transfer you. <clears throat> How does he do that? The, well, he dies on the cross for sin. He's buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. That's the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When you believe the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, Jesus was buried and he was raised on the third day of his burial, when you believe that, you're saved. When you believe it, you're saved. When you believe that Christ died personally for you, because it is you that must believe. Now, the you that's used in our passage is a collective group of, of yous that have gotten saved. It's plural. You that have gotten saved, when Paul went in and preached Acts 17, you remember? Acts 17 is where it's listed in the book of Acts where Paul converted these people of Thessalonica. And so, we have that. So, so you also became imitators. And so the spotlight falls on imitators. It's important that you understand that. It's a predicate nominative. It is used to, emphasize, to, be, to be emphatic in defining the subject along with the verb of what they've become. These believers that got saved when Paul's missionary team went in and evangelized the area... They didn't spend that long a time. We saw three Sabbaths and they had to leave. They were forced out. But he left the church. And before they got through, he had grounded, ground them in some basic understanding of the Word of God. And later he's going to send Timothy back in there and, 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 and teach him more of the Word of God. But these people, but they were, listen, they were suffered they were saved out of great suffering, and they, look, 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 watch this now, verse 6, and you also became imitators of us, in other words, they, were, they went on preaching the gospel, they immediately went, began preaching the gospel that got them saved, and giving the message of security of their salvation to the people, and whatever else Paul was able to teach within a couple weeks, which probably was a whole lot for Paul, but he preached all night. It was done, listen, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that something? I'm so thankful for those of you that just continued to come to Bible study, did social distancing, wore your mask when it was proper, washed your hands, did all the things that they said science says to, for us to do. We did it. And you were faithful to come. And I salute you for that, for that's how you live through troubling times. You don't shut down. In troubling times, you don't shut down. That's the way the world works. That's not the way God works. Listen, the Christian church is always in troubled times. 
Tribulation, listen, tribulation, write this down, John 16, 33. Are you in the world? Well, you live in it. You're not of it, but you're in it. You know what that says? In the world, you will have tribulations. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It does Romans 5, 3 through 5. Should have wrote that down, shouldn't you? Imitators. Imitators. You also became, heiress tense, changed condition in the Christian life by taking in milk doctrines. Imitators of us and the Lord. I mean, how do you get from salvation to imitators? You got to study basic Bible doctrine in the Bible called milk. Milk doctrines. Well, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's go to Hebrews a moment. I want you to go, go in your Bible to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And now I'm going to study this on probably point two or something. I don't know. Somewhere later I got it, but I'm just going to introduce it. I feel led to introduce it. We st we're in Hebrews 5, 11, 12, 13, 14 is where we're going. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain. Since you have, this is what's happened to some believers, you've become dull of hearing, lack of interest. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, but you're dull of hearing, so you don't have anything to teach, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and he's going to explain what they are, you have need of milk, not meat. Are you with me? Yes. No, I... Have is it, is it, you ever got your Bibles open? Yes. Okay. I feel like I'm working hard on something I shouldn't be working hard on. Listen, the elementary, the elementary principles of the oracles of God are milk doctrines. Right? And you have come to need milk, not solid food. Now... Verse 13, everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's a baby. He's an infant. He's a baby. But solid food, that's meat. I'm, I'm reading from the New American Standard. But solid food or meat is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. If you want to know more about your Senses tra pra trained to practice uh, the sense of good and evil. Go to Genesis. And look at Adam and Eve and the tree of knowledge of what? And study what God told them to do and not to do and what they did. And you will understand what he meant by this. I lost my place. It's okay to lose in a Bible study, but don't lose it in life. Your place. <laughs> I, I know, sometimes I just talk to myself. All right. Look at, look at, verse, look at verse 14 is, was my point. For me, solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. If you want to know, if you want an example of how that is and how that works, go back there and read that. You know, you go to Genesis 2, 17, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then you go to Genesis 3rd chapter, about, you know, read down to about verse 7 or so until they eat and what happens to them and all that. Then you got it. There's your example. But, here is the principle that is absolutely lost in Christian churches, and that's why they, they're flopping all over the place theologically. They don't know the difference between milk and meat. Is there a difference? Paul says there's a difference. There's a difference in how they help you grow in your Christian life. You have to start on milk and then move to meat.
Yeah, boy. So here we are in 1 Thessalonians 1.6. You also became, that's that changed condition by milk doctrines, imitators. How are we going to become imitators? By milk doctrine. Imitators as of having received, decomai, the word, i.e., milk, categorical doctrines, in much tribulation. Listen, it's one thing to, listen, it's normal to have tribulation in the world. What's not normal is to have it in your life. When tribulation of the world is in you, then the world's in you. The way it should be is that you're in the world and the world's not in you. You're in the world to have a, to be a model to the believers and to be a witness for Christ. You're the light to the world. You're not the light to the Christian church. Right? You're the model. You're the light to the world. A light set on a, you know, a, the light set on the hill, not under the bushel, not, not covered up and hid. Do you know, listen, listen, I was reminded yesterday at the School of Biblical Theology of an, in a wonderful principle that we have missed. We, we teach it, but it needs to be, you haven't missed it. I need to bring it back to your attention. Jesus was raised on first fruits, which was a Jewish holiday. It's called first fruits because it's the first of the harvest season. Fifty days later is the feast of weeks that we call Pentecost, the 50th day. That's the last of the harvest. It was at Pentecost that Jesus baptized the 120 that became the church. And the baptismal work of the Holy Spirit began and formed the church through the book of Acts. The church age, under the new covenant, the church age is the great harvest period. For the gospel of Jesus Christ. There, there, God never set up any other dispensation in all of biblical history that was called the great harvest. And we listen to the world tell us that we can't preach the gospel, that we can't do this and we can't do that. And we live in the time period that goes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the rapture of the church called the great harvest, and he proved it. If you will just read Acts 2 and see the great harvest began, from 120 it went to 3,000. It went to daily converts. It went to 5,000. Just in Acts 2. And here we sit. I'm telling you, church, we've got to be evangelical this, listen, this is the period of great harvest in the world. We shouldn't have to see it just in other parts of the country. We ought to see it in America. You know, we're a large country. <laughs> you know, we're a pretty large group. We're a pretty large country. People are coming here all the time because of our prosperity. God sent them from all over the world that we can convert them and send them back as missionaries. All these kids coming into our universities. We live in the greatest harvest period of human his biblical history. He calls it the great harvest period. Sometimes we forget that. We f sometimes we forget that. Well, anyhow, I just taught that to those in the School of Biblical Theology yesterday. You know, anybody can go to that school. 
You don't have to be, quote, a preacher or something. You can go just because you love the Word of God. Listen, he says that you receive the Word. This is the Word in their growth for their, uh, for, uh, be, to be imitators in much tribulation. And, and you can read about that. Boy, did they get it. Uh, right off the bat in Acts 17. Listen, the devil, the devil ain't going to give up territory without a fight. But listen, listen, we beat the devil straight up at the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, uh, listen, Hebrews 2.14, when he died on that cross, the devil is beat. Now, he's still in existence. He's going to be in existence until the second coming of Christ. Then he's going put, to put, be put in hot storage for a while. But look, your great enemy in this world is not the devil. The greatest enemy in this world is yourself. <laughs> if you could just get control of yourself, that'd be pretty good. I mean, most of the battles I, f I fight are within me. I don't fight them outside. I fight them inside. That's what mature believers do. Well, come on now. And then he gets, says, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Much tribulation, but much joy. Much tribulation, but joy. And where does the joy come from? The indwelling Holy Spirit. Who can never leave you, John 14, 16, 17, can never leave you. Once he enters, and he enters at the point of salvation, one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is salvation, boom, indwells you. Your body becomes a temple of God. He can never leave. Why? He's the dynamic ministry of great harvest. My, my, my. Boy, you ought to read John 14, 15 to 16. Listen to 2 Corinthians 7, 5 and 6. For even when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were afflicted on every side. Conflict on the outside. Fears on the inside. But God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus, a teacher of the word of God. A teacher of the word of God. Another brother with the same war scars on him from the battling of the angelic conflict. You go out in the world and you preach the gospel, they're going to cut you up a little bit. But be a good cheer. Be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. You are an overcomer. That ain't going to give up territory without a fight. You wouldn't expect anything less. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6 chapter. Come on, church. Don't carry it in, you, don't carry it in your trunk. Carry it on the driver of the car. <laughs> I think we carry our full armor in the trunk most of the time. We don't carry it on us. Listen, put it on, he says. Put it on. Walk it out. Well, anyhow. Two. The Thessalonian believers became imitators of the Lord by taking responsibility for securing their faith in God's amazing grace. Salvation. You know who has to, you know where your assurance comes from? Understanding God secured your salvation. See, what you got to have is assurance that God secured your salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest a man should boast. That he's got it secured. John, the 10th chapter, 28, 29, 30. You're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God. Nobody gets you out of the hands. That's good hands keeping people. Listen, the, the issue is not security of your salvation. That's in the hands of God. What is the problem is your assurance of it. That's why milk doctrines are essentially needed in the life of baby believers. It's essential. And when they get it, they become imitators of the Lord. They begin to walk it out in their life. He is their role model, and then you will become a role model to others in your spiritual growth maturity. Wow, wow, wow. Isn't that wonderful, church? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Listen to 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Like newborn babes, 
long for the pure milk of the word. Babes is the word in the Greek language, brethos, and it means a baby on a mother's breast. That's why it's pure milk. That's called pure milk of the word. So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. The word salvation is, is soteria. We call it soteriology in the School of Biblical Theology, and we do a whole course on it called soteriology. Remember, genomai, that's used in verse 6 and 7 like in verse 5, is referring to a changed condition in the soul of a newly saved person in verse 6 and verse 7, dealing with milk doctrines. Milk doctrines are going to change their assurance of their salvation and their trust in God Almighty. So what would be some of these milk doctrines? Let me mention just seven. I would tell you, here are seven. You can go to our website and find more, but here would be the seven that I would think about. They're not necessarily in order, but here's how I wrote them down. One of the first things a new believer needs to know is the essence of God. And I'll tell you why. They may know about God. They may have been in church all their life and never got saved. Therefore, they don't know God as their father. They know God as God among the gods. But they don't know him as a personal relationship guy called father. The first thing that you have to teach a convert, even though he says he's been in church all his life, listen, you don't, get, you don't become a believer by going to church. You become a believer by hearing and believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can sleep in a garage and never become a car. Come on. And so we need to be aware of that. So the first thing I would teach, I would teach the essence box of God. They need to, need, need to know who God is, so that, and you need to show them examples of it. God is omnipotent. Show them some examples from the Bible. That's how we teach the children in our church. We teach them the essence of God. We teach them the essence of God till they got it. Then what you should do off from that essence of God is to teach them the Trinity or the Godhead. How, how, the, how God the Father functions, how God the Son functions, and how God the Holy Spirit functions in the life of a person that is saved. Because I promise you, they don't know it. The second thing is they need to understand what the gospel is and how a person gets saved by it. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How you get saved by it is Romans 1, 16. And the security of it is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The gospel isn't that he just died for your sins. You don't have a gospel where they just died for your sins. Three guys died for sin on that day on that same hill. Which one is the Messiah? Which one's the Savior of the world? The one who was raised from the dead on the third day as he said he would. Now you got a gospel. They need to be told, and that's what, a, what does I have to, you have to understand that he died personally for you, and that you have to personally believe that in order for you to be saved. And when you do, God becomes your father. John 14, 6, no man can come to the father. No man can come to the father. He can come to God where he, he has God consciousness. But God is, th th he's just a God among the gods. You understand, to the, to the unbeliever. I was that guy, I understand that. You may not, but I understand that. 
I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word. I know. I know. So that, that needs to be understood. They need to understand that in order to understand evangelism. He, here's the problem. A lot of people go out and they call evangelism by sharing their testimony. But they're, usually their testimony is all about their sin and not about their salvation. Evangelism is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to share how you did it and how you got it, as long as the gospel has covered it. But you're, listen, you're not evangelizing when you go out and you tell somebody all about your sinful life that you got saved from, and then you depart and leave. The God, you must present the gospel. Everybody's got a sinful life. Everybody's a sin. First Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. First Timothy 1.15. Everybody's got a story of sin if he's got any age to him. My goodness. Stand around and talk about that. Listen, that's what we used to, that's what I used to do when I went to bars and sit around and drink and talk about our sinful life and compare it. I don't know what you did, that's what I did. And we thought that was a pretty big deal. That's, that's how I spent my time until I met Christ. So evangelism, you need to understand about evangelism, and evangelism is important. A baby believer can be an evangelist. I was. I shared everybody. I was told early in my life about this, and I went out and shared the gospel with people and how important it was for them to personally believe. If you, want to have, if you wanted God to become your father and have a relationship with God as your father, you had to, get, you had to believe the gospel of Christ. I, I right off the bat, I began leading people to Christ through the gospel because I was trained well in it. I became an imitator of Paul, so to speak. I became an imitator of the person who led me to Christ and told me how to do it to others. Who said, listen, I know you've probably got a sordid past, Rod Adam, <laughs> but don't talk about it. That's not what's important anymore. What you got saved from has got what you saved for. What you got saved for. I th I'm so thankful to God for that guy. Well, anyhow, evangelism. Number four, you ought to study the four sections of the 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity. You, if, you, if you don't have that, go to the website and pull down the 50. I think John has it up there, 50 free things or something. Listen, there are four sections. You ought to study those four sections. That's milk. When you get through those 50 things, you can never lose any time in eternity. You ought to have assurance of your salvation for sure. Sure, that's why I wrote it. The way I wrote it. You should milk doctrines. Just don't milk doctrines. You should teach positional sanctification. You should teach positional sanctification. Who you are in Christ. In that, in that pamphlet, of, you go back to the back of that pamphlet of 50 things, there's a section called status privileges. There are 20 things that you receive at the point of salvation. Who you are in Christ. If you want to know, well, what will I be imitating about the Lord? Study it, and it'll show you 20 things. You know, and they're because you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're a new creation. Well, what does that mean? Well, study those 20 things, and I'll tell you what it means, what it means to be in Christ. Who is your new identity? Who are you imitating the Lord? What does that mean? Study and see. He's a son, I'm a son. He's a priest, I'm a priest. Yada, yada. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. He's an heir, I'm an heir. He's got inheritance, I got the inheritance. And then the list goes on. That's what you ought to be teaching the milk doctrines, in my opinion. Eternal life. You ought to teach eternal life. You ought to teach eternal life. Eternal life means eternal. <laughs> when do you get it? Salvation. How do you keep it? God's grace. The security is always in God. Assurance is in you. Point three. Where, where am I? I got... 
three minutes or so. Believers became imitators of the Lord by progression in their spiritual growth in the Christian life. Now, I want you to pay attention to me. There's two diets and three groups that Paul's talking about, or the writer of Hebrews. Now, the two diets, this is two diets for believers. What are they? Milk and meat. Okay? Go, go to the head of the line, you smart ones. Go right to the head of the line. Are you having fun? Okay. Because I am. I, I, I'm having fun. I always have fun when I have people come that want to study and learn. That's what makes it fun for me. Milk and meat. Now watch the three groups. In Hebrews 11, 12, 13, 14. He mentions three groups that are really important for us to understand. There's a male group, the, the diets, and then the groups. In 11, he talks about backsliding believers, which we would call carnal, who have become dull of hearing. When they, come, when they become dull of hearing, we call that reversionism. Now, I'm going to tell you something really important. Backsliding is found in Proverbs 14.14. 14. And I wrote the Hebrew word down for that on your paper. Shug. S-U-G. Like sugar. We would refer to that as a carnal believer like in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. If you want to know a reversionist, you go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah coined the difference between backsliding and reversionism. We would call backsliding carnality because you're sliding back. You can stop and slide forward. It's, it's, not, it's not difficult. Unless your car gets out of control. That's reversionism. Jeremiah used a different word, which I wrote on your paper, Beshuba. And it's and I just gave you some passages just for you to whet your appetite. Uh, second chapter nineteen three chapter three six through eight, uh, eleven through fourteen. The fifth chapter five six. The eighth chapter, uh, eighth chapter five six. The fourteenth chapter seven. That will give you a pretty good idea. And if you know anything about Jeremiah and the fifth cycle of divine discipline upon Israel, you will understand the concept of reversionism. In Hebrews 5.11, he is warning the church, as well as Israel, apparently, of this problem. In verse 11, when he says, you've become dull of hearing. In the seventh chapter of Acts, Stephen declares the, the Jewish people gathered to listen to him right out of the Jeremiah's mouth. He called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised of the heart. Who refuse, no matter what they see, they refuse to believe. That's reversionism. You should always make a, a stark difference between carnality, backsliding, and reversionism. So Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that is, is warning them. And I gave you scripture on that. 
in Hebrews uh, 5.12, he tells you what, he tells them what they're going to have to do to get back. How to get, get, like we talk about how to get out of carnality back into spirituality. How do I get out of reversionism back into into, um, spiritual growth? And so he, in verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, but you're not because you got into reversionism, you have need again, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, milk. This person was at a place in his spiritual life where he was capable of teaching other people. Got into carnality, didn't come out of it, got into reversionism, and is sinking like the Titanic. Under Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5 through 11, divine discipline. Where God is trying to bring them back. If he dies in the sinking Titanic, is he going to go to heaven? Yes. Mama, 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 I've said it all day long. Because your security is where? In the Lord, it's in his hands. John 10, 28 through 30. Stop listening to people tell you that foolishness. They're trying to get you to live by the law, not by grace. Not that foolishness. Listen, if you study Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, you will see that. Compare that to 1 John 5, 16. They will die a sin unto death. Will they go to heaven? Of course they will. Why? Because their security is not in themselves. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. These dead men should boast. I, 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 look, I'm, I'm getting upset with people on the internet right now. Not, not, not with you who have come. Now, listen, here's verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to words of righteousness because he's a baby. This person who was mature enough to teach other people have digressed or retrogressed, have retrogressed all the way back to being an infant who needs milk again to get reestablished. Isn't that something? Retrogress or progress is the name of your Christian life. Where are you? I don't know, but you know. But boy, you know, ain't nobody fooling you. Meat, solid food, is for the mature. Well, I got to quit. Listen what you have to do. Here's what, here's a home assignment. All right, do point four. Because point four, point four, tells you how to become an imitator so that you can become a model. If you don't get point four, you're not become a model. Next week, I'll come back and talk about this a little more. But please read that. Please read that because I'm listing. I listed 15. That, that, and listen, you probably got 15 that you like better, and that's okay with me. I'll just put 15 down. That that would be my starter kit for the meat doctrines. That's just be, that would just be my starter kit. Well, I want to thank you for coming today, both those who drove in. If you're in a 40-mile distance, I say this all the time, you need to come and be with the church. Why? Because you've got a spiritual gift. At the point of salvation, you was given a spiritual gift. Read 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And... If this is where you can be fed, then this is where your gifts should serve. That's how you know where you should go. So take a look at point number four. Next week we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about how to model. I'll I'll take you to modeling school. That'll be something. All right. All right. Let's have a word of prayer and then Rico dismisses. Hey, listen, I, I have a, I, I know Gary, Gary shared with me.
that he will be speaking to the Truckers International. They're all over the world. Thursday night at 6. Gary? Yes. Thursday night at 6. Uh, so be much in prayer uh, for Gary. Uh, what did I say, Thursday night? Yes. Thursday night at 6. Uh, that he can touch truckers all over the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whew, that's about as good as it gets, Gary. All right, let's have prayer, and then Rick will close us. Hey, Gary, just close us out in a word of prayer, will you? Father, there's nothing on earth as important as what we're doing here today. And I thank you for a communicator who never gives up. I thank you for him and his family <coughs> and his gift and others in this congregation who has men ministries and their gifts. Father, we need uh, to be reminded this last election was one of the worst things that ever happened to America. But the real worst thing is the believers who have nothing to give and those who do not want the truth. Sanctify these things. Use Thursday for your glory. <clears throat> 